And so imagine there's a tree that basically represents a corporate hierarchy, and there's some people like, you know, just short, for shortcut, we'll call it A, B, C, D. You know, clearly they're nameless because they're, you know, corporate drones and don't have any uh, identity. Okay, so, so, you know, here's like a corporate hierarchy. Um, and the idea is, now there's like a startup that's like recruiting these employees to join the startup. And the startup wants to like really ideally, like it would like to recruit like as many of these engineers as possible. Uh, but the only thing is nobody wants to be in a company where their like boss is also present. So basically the startup has to pay, like let's say the startup can actually recruit anyone it wants. The only limitation is that it can't recruit people uh, that you know share an edge in this tree because that would mean they have like a boss employee relationship. So you can recruit, for example, A and C, or, or like, or no, you can't recruit A and C, but you can recruit A and E uh, because like you know E indirectly reports to A, but E doesn't really have to hate A with a passion. So you you know uh, you can recruit A and E, but you can't recruit like. A and B or B and E. So basically, you can you can't recruit two people to share the same edge. Uh, plus, additionally, assume like not every like engineer is like equally productive. Um, you know, assume that every employee actually has like a number indicating like their value to this potential startup. So you know, uh, every employee will have like some number, etc. So, so, so basically, um, you know, your, your task is, is how do you select the, the subset of people to recruit such that you respect this constraint, nobody has to work with their former boss, uh, and you maximize the value of the employees that you get. Like you maximize the sum. Like imagine like the number is basically kind of like their expected contribution. Uh, and so you, you have to like maximize the sum. Uh, so how would you do that? Well, first of all, let, let's observe that this is actually, yep. So is there a fixed number of people that you... No. The uh, question was, uh, is there like a fixed number of people? No. Uh, no, you could, ideally you want to recruit like as many people as possible, but you just can't recruit everyone because you have to respect this constraint that nobody can work with their boss. Uh, so actually, uh, you might observe that this is actually the tree analog. Uh, the, this is the tree analog of the a house robber problem that we did in part one. So the house robber problem was basically the same thing, but on a line. It was kind of stated differently, but you know, basically the idea is that you had a line of houses, right? You had this like line of houses, and you basically were not allowed to rob two houses that are consecutive to each other, uh, because you know that sets off an alarm or suspicion or whatever. And so basically you could rob as many houses as you want, but the only reason you don't rob any, all of them is because you can't rob two houses that share an edge. So in the robber problem, this was just given to you as an array, uh, and it was guaranteed linear. Uh, but here we are doing this on a tree. So if you recall, you know, the solution to the robber problem was something pretty easy. We just basically gave everything a number from like, you know, we, we, we said like i is an index, and we gave everything an index. Um, so this, the robber problem is basically a special case of this problem, right? But when, but when it's linear, it's much easier, because this is all in an array, and we gave, gave kind of an equation, we said like let f of i be the best payoff for the robber if the next house that the robber, if the robber goes in a line deciding do I rob this house, do I rob this house, do I rob this house? And let's say the robber is currently at index i in their decision making. Let f of i be the maximum value that the robber can attain. Assuming that they're at index i in their decision making and they are allowed to rob you know, the current house. They have not robbed the previous house. And so based on that, we wrote an equation. We wrote you know, our recurrence, right? And uh, you know, how did we write our recurrence? We basically said, well, the robber makes the best of two choices at any given time, right? The robber uh, basically picks the max of the two choices. And what are the two choices? Well, uh, the robber may rob the current house, in which case they capture value i. 
Um, and they don't get to rob another house for two houses, right? Like they, they have to skip the next one if they capture like the value at index i. This is like the value of the home at index i. Um, otherwise, they just skip. They don't capture the value, but they go on to the next index. And you can write some easy base cases here where, where when you hit the end, it's worth zero. Like if you're at the end, you can do no, no more. And then, you know, any, anything that's out of bounds here just gets uh, zero. Like if this i parameter is out of bounds, you can't access this value, then, you know, the base case is just if this is out of bounds, then return zero. Uh, so, you know, the, the, these are basically like, the, this was basically the equation we wrote for the robber problem. So, uh, the, you know, hopefully, like, you know, uh, since you've been following some of the like previous sessions, this is like very straightforward, right? This is not like, uh, you know, there's nothing like too complicated here. Uh, okay, so then how do you translate this over to a tree? Well, it's not hard. It's, it's actually not hard. Uh, it's just, you know, the only thing is you, you have to kind of, um, you know, sort of unbreak your thinking from that sort of like mode of, uh, you know, thinking it all, everything has to refer to some index. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not hard. Like, so, so the, what should the function variable be? Uh, so we have to write like f something, right? But like, what is the, what is this variable going to be? So it's actually like a straightforward answer. It's just like some people, uh, you know, hit kind of a mental roadblock uh, with this. But, but of course, it's, it can just be the node again. It can just be like the node, except we won't identify with an index i, we'll identify with just like, you know, the node pointer. Well, you can think of it as one of various ways. You can think of it as like, this is just the, like, you know, memory address of the node, or you can think of it as like, uh, we will actually go and assign each node like a unique number. Uh, but, but, you know, this is some kind of identifier of the node. So we'll call like f of n, n is basically the, you know, the node, right? And here's what we'll say about f of n. Um, here's what we'll say about f of n is we will say that, um, well, so, so basically you, you have a choice, right? Like if, if you are at this node, you can take this node or you can skip it. Kind of same, same principle as before. So what happens if you uh, take this node? If you take this node, you have to skip all the children of this node. So basically, uh, then the, the recursion continues on the grandchildren of the node. Make sense? Like, you know, just like before, we would have continued with index. Remember before, like, f of i was continuing, in the case where you take it, it was continuing with f of i plus 2. Well, in this case, it's going to continue with f of i, plus, you know, well, it's going to continue with, you take the value, so you take uh, n dot value, or let's put it on the next line. This is going to be, again, a max, because you want to take the best of all the decisions. So you, make the, you take the best of the two decisions. One is uh, n dot value, so you take the value of the node, and then you basically take, uh, you would have to take the sum over all uh, random children of this node. The sum over all grandchildren g of f of g. And that would be your payoff. So, uh, you know, to explain this, like, you, you know, if you take this node, then you cannot take the children, and then the recursion essentially continues on the next level. And, and each of these sub subtrees would then be independent, like, because you didn't take, you didn't, because if you took A and you didn't take B or C, then basically each of these subtrees, like E, F, G, H, you know, whatever they have in their subtrees, like, these are all going to be, like, independently solvable. We will, we will want to maximize each of these independently because they have no interaction between each other, right? They're kind of separated out by the fact that you didn't take B or C. So now, you know, you can take any subset of E you want that satisfies the constraint. You can take any subset of this you want. You can take any subset of this you want. You can take any subset of this you want. And so, you, and, and so uh, you know, before, we, before in the robber problem, we had like n dot value plus just the one grandchild. We just, you know, we, we have had only one grandchild because the structure was linear, right? In the, in the robber problem, it was kind of like this. Uh, and so if you took this, then you would exclude this, and now you can take this again. 
And so you just had one grandchild. But here, you know, you can have arbitrarily many. Uh, it just depends on the structure of the problem, so you have to do sum over all grandchildren. Okay. Um, and uh, what's the other choice? So the other choice is you basically just skip, right? And if you skip, what is the what is the answer? Like, what do you think I should put on this like second line of the max? Sum over all children C, right? Sum over all children C of F of C. So these are basically like the. Uh, These are the two items in the max. So it, it's pretty like straightforward if you like think about it. Like there's nothing like that new here or anything. But you know, uh, some people kind of face a mental roadblock when like looking at a problem like this because maybe you've like never seen a problem in a tree like this before. Uh, so so you know, we do have to ask some questions here. Like uh, for example, like what is the time complexity of evaluating this formula using dynamic programming? So f of n is the value at a node, right? Like no, 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 no. n dot value is the value at a node. Uh, f is like the maximum solution for that subtree. Like it's the best solution for that subtree. So overall, we want to we want to get uh, we basically we want to solve for f of a. That's what we want. Like the overall solution to the problem is f of a. It's basically the solution to the subtree rooted at A. Yeah, so. It's the best solution. So if you write uh, the notation that's FC, uh -huh. that's basically like F of child one plus child two plus child. Yes, yes. That, that, is, that is sum over all children C, that's what we mean, yes. Okay. Like C does not refer to the node C or G. Like this, is, the, it refers to like this item. So we, we should, should we not have a summation sign? when we write fc? Sure, sure. Uh, like, yeah, I could write it like, you know, I, I mean, I could write it like like so, like sigma c and c. Uh, I don't know if that's more like, uh, some people just, they see mathy symbols and they get discouraged. Uh, no, I, I swear it's true. Like, math has like a, like, like for some, I don't know why, but like for some reason, like, people see math symbols and they get discouraged. Uh, but yes, okay, well, I mean, I think because there's a lot of summing, like I think you, you guys, y'all can be like okay with this like one notation, which is like like this symbol just means kind of sum. Uh, and so you, you know you see kind of this notation, like that just means like sum over all c in children, yeah. like and, and this is like sum over all uh, g in grandchildren. Like, like that's that's all this notation means. Uh, it just means like sum over this set. Like grandchildren of n is a set. Uh, so sum over all g and grandchildren of f of g. Sum over all c and children of f of c. Okay. Uh, but, but that's like the only like we'll try not to use too much other like more complex math notation. Okay. Uh, so hopefully like this is like pretty understandable. So like this does not refer to this C. This is just a coincidence of naming. Like this is more like F of C, F of B plus F of C here for A. For A this would evaluate to F of B plus F of C. The sum over all the children. Uh, so the overall solution is like the solution to the subtree rooted at A because that's the top of the tree. And so basically it's saying, I'm saying like either you take the value like if you are some node n, either you take the value and then you sum over all of its grandchildren, because then all of its grandchildren can, like their subtrees can be solved independently, or you sum over all children, you know, because you skip this node, then you don't take its value, and then you sum over, you know, you, you basically take the best solution for this subtree, and then independently you take the best solution for this subtree. And you can take them independently because since you didn't take A, there's going to be no like immediate connection between these two subtrees. And that's also why you can sub the grandchildren independently. So two questions, right? What is like the time complexity of this, one? Uh, and two, uh, basically what is the, you know, does dynamic programming actually help here? Would there be a problem if you solve this with just normal recursion? So, so like remember in the, there's one, you know, kind of, clear argument we can make for why you definitely need to use dynamic programming here. Uh, what is kind of like, uh, I don't know, can anybody come up with it? Like, what is like the most like 
kind of obvious, like straightforward, well, maybe not obvious, but like, like most elegant argument for why you really have to use dynamic programming here. Why will the complexity be bad if you use recursion? Because it's going to take a lot of time to calculate those sums all the time. Well, no, that's not really necessarily the case because, like, even the dynamic programming uh, solution will need to calculate sums. N no, uh, what I was kind of like thinking of is uh, you can just argue for it this way, right? Like, remember that in the robber problem we showed that you need to use dynamic programming, but the robber problem is an instance of this. Like, the robber problem is a special case of this. So there's no way that this doesn't need dynamic programming treatment if even the special case of it, just the one where everything's linear, already needs dynamic programming. Because that's just a sub, you know, that's just a sub case of this. But this is just a more general problem. Uh, but in kind of broader terms, the way we can, well, the way we can see it is uh, we can also see that like, you know, like where does basically the duplication come from? Well, the duplication comes from this. So uh, let's say you do sum over all children. Sum of those children will sum over all of their children. Uh, so basically, so basically, in the kind of like the call, if we do, if we show the recursion tree here, we can erase this now. If we do the, but, but if we show the recursion tree, like let, let, what, what happens when this function is called with a? So function of a will call all of its children. So like A will call like whatever, B and C. Like let's say this is a child and this is a child. But the function f of A, this is not, in the, this is not the tree uh, for A, but the function f of A will call also the function calls for its grandchildren. So it will call some function calls for like all of its grandchildren. So it will call, you know, whatever, some like f of, you know, f of something here, f of something here. Uh, it'll make some function calls for all of its grandchildren, right? But, but look at this. The, so after these are evaluated, the child, you know, the, these child nodes will also call these grandchildren. So there's basically kind of this duplication of cases. If you, if you don't use dynamic programming, what will happen is, uh, you know, you will first solve these like grandchildren cases, and then you will end up solving them a second time, right? When, when the child needs them. So is it because just, because these calls will basically in turn meet their own children, which are the same as the grandchildren of G. It's much easier to see if you just look at you know the robber problem itself. The, uh, the robber problem is just a very simplified special case that helps us you know see this behavior. Uh, so you know you just have a linear chain of houses, right? You just have like this linear chain of houses. Uh, you know the issue is that when we open a function call for this node, it has to call this one and this one, right? But this one, again, calls this one. So you basically have a recursion tree where like f of zero, like if we let this node be zero, one, two, three, f of zero will call f of one, and f of two, this is a little bit like Fibonacci or something now, uh, f of zero will call f of one and f of two, but f of one in turn will call f of two and f of three, and f of two will call f of three and f of four. So you see that, you know, Unless you kind of have this memoization, which kind of turns it into something like this, uh, you will instead end up having like the sprawling recursion tree, right? Where f of one calls f of two and f of three like this, you will end up with you know that, uh, and here you will have f of three and f of four, and oh no, look at that, you have duplication here. And we already saw that once you have any kind of duplication, the problem is that since recursion is self-similar, it means that you know here we, we are solving the f of three case twice. But you know if you kind of continue drawing this recursion tree, each of these f of three cases will create, you know, uh, they'll create. Um, well, we didn't even have to look all the way to f of three. We could have just taken this duplication, sure, but. Uh, each of these f of three cases will create an additional two f of six cases, right? We'll get like f of six, f of six here, uh, and this one will create that too. And eventually, you have like this exponential blow up caused by the fact that these are multiplying. Like you know, f of zero expanded into two f of threes, but each of those will expand into two f of sixes, and you have this like exponential blow up effect. And you know, we definitely discussed that kind of like in depth in like the earlier sessions.
Uh, so uh, we see that, you know, of course we need to use dynamic programming. Uh, but like, what is the uh, time complexity of this even using dynamic programming? So let's say we use dynamic programming. How do we do it? Well, it's, it's you know, the same way. We just, you know, whatever identifier we used for the node, whether it's a unique number or it's, uh, you know, uh, just like a, a pointer to the node or whatever, like the memory address of the node. Uh, whatever we're using here, uh, you know, we cache based on that. That's fine. This goes into a map. Uh, in this case, you know, unless, unless you numbered the nodes from like 0 to n minus 1, unless you have such a numbering of nodes, you pretty much have to go with a map when you implement this. You know, you don't go with an array because, you know, you need, like, these are like random memory addresses. Uh, so, if you number the nodes 0 to n minus 1, then you can go with an, you know, you can go with an array when you, when you implement this. Uh, but, you know, we have to ask, like, basically, what is the time complexity? Because, uh, so, again, how do, you, how do you evaluate the time complexity of a dynamic programming problem? Hopefully, uh, you remember, what, what is it? Number of states. Number of states? Yeah. Multiplied by the time per state. Right? Like, don't assume that a state is order 1. That is true for some problems, but not for others. So actually here, we might kind of like fall into uh, a bit of a quagmire, because uh, here, OK, what is the number of states here? That should be easy. N? N? N. Yeah, it's, it's linear, basically, right? Uh, well, uh, I want to use like, OK, uh, I, I will use N, but you know. Uh, not to be confused with this n, obviously. This is like a node parameter. Uh, number of states is n. Uh, and what is the time per state? I think this one's kind of quite a bit harder. Be be because, because like every state, yes, like it's true that every state uh, is computed in some amount of time and there's n such states. But like what, what makes you assume it's order one? And like is it order one? So if, I, if we go down the recursion first time and as we are unwinding, <clears throat> We will just uh, populate our map. So, well, okay, okay, but you might be getting ahead of yourself here. Like that, that, that's maybe like dynamic. Um, that may be more like kind of like bottom, bottom up. But even then, even then, what makes you think that that really uh, is linear time? Because after all, there's no like. Oh, okay, to be clear, like this is not a binary tree. Like you can't assume that something like that every like. Every node is like left plus right, or even if you have grandchildren, that there's like at most four. Like it, it's arbitrary. Like the structure can, it's an n airy tree. Like it can, you know, have any weight at a node. Uh, but then it cannot be more than n, and n is finite. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I think I think you have like the right argument. But but okay. Uh, well, first we, we note that you know the only like clear bound we can immediately put on this, just looking at these summations, is that it's no more than n time per state. Right? Because there's at most n grandchildren, and we can definitely find them in at least linear time, for sure. Uh, and like, same for, same for here. So basically, worst case scenario, like, like, interpreting big O is like an upper bound only. Like, that is actually like the classic definition of big O, but often when people use big O, they mean, use it to mean like, exactly this time range. But, uh, you know, letting big O stand for its like real meaning, which is like, uh, as an upper bound, like this is like you know you could bound this with order n and say that this problem is n squared, but actually it's better than that. Actually, it, it, the the full solution is linear, uh, because because remember this is not like time per state. This is actually more like average time per state, and actually we can show that the average time per state is order one. Uh, and why is it? Well, first it helps if you kind of understand like why it would be order one if you didn't have this line. Like this line kind of complicates things. Uh, the grandchildren, but what about like if you just like what if you had to just um, imagine a problem where you just have to have to have a tree, and you are basically asked for each no like place at each node. This is like a simple tree problem. Uh, given an arbitrary binary tree, uh, at each node place the sum of the values of the children. Uh, would that be like an n squared problem? No, it would be order n. And here's kind of the argument you can make. Like you can say like. Yes, it is true that this is a loop. Yes, it is true that this is a loop. Uh, well, look, let's look at the children part first. Yes, it's true that summing over all the children is a loop. So a given node may take more than order one time to compute. 
But keep in mind that every node, um, the, every node has a unique node as its parent. So basically, every node of the tree can only appear in the summation of one other node. And that actually bounds it. So like, yes, you can have a node that has a ton of children. You can have a node like this. You, and, and for this node, it will take a while to sum them all up. But the flip side of that is that each of these nodes can never appear in any other node's summation for the children. Because every node has a unique parent. So basically, the total number of things summed over all nodes, this is kind of like an amortized sort of, well, kind of like an amortized analysis sort of argument. Uh, you can show that like the total number of summations over all nodes is still like linear, because every node can only appear in one other node's summation. Does that, does that, does that make sense? Now, now does, we have to check that that argument actually like still applies to the grandchildren. But it does, right? Because every grandchild can only appear in one node summation. Every grandchild has a unique grandparent, right? Like uh, a node that appears as the grandchild of one node will not appear in the summation for any other node in that capacity. So yeah, th so that, that actually means that like this will be um, computed in, uh, like basically the sizes of all of these summations uh, between all the nodes are linear. Uh, and so the average time per state will be order one. Uh, because, you know, on average, like basically over all the different summations, there are n terms here over all n nodes. So on average, the average node only has a constant number of terms in each of these. Or in this case, it might be more helpful if you like don't like think of it as average time. Just think of it as like, what is the total time over all the function calls spent in this summation? Here it is linear, here it is linear and there's a linear number of function calls, and so there's a linear number of max operations and additions and max taking and all that. Uh, so it's linear everywhere, and you end up with order n total time. And, and so, yeah, with dynamic programming, you solve this problem in linear time. Uh, without dynamic programming, using naive recursion, this would actually be solved in uh, like basically exponential time because you have the exponential blow up. Um, and you'll also note that like you can also solve this problem bottom up. Uh, so what does actually like solving a problem bottom up here involve? So this is like the top down solution, right? We just use the recursion and we will attach a cache here to, to you know, make the recursion work this way uh, and make this recursion be like order n total time. We will attach a cache here. We'll just do the, the standard cache attaching process uh, for top down. But like, what, what does it mean to solve a problem like this bottom up? Well, it just basically means that you, you know, you will kind of traverse the tree in sort of like post order traversal type traversal, and you will, uh, you know, just kind of evaluate your leads first. So essentially, uh, and, and why, why is that? Because like we look at like what is the dependency here? So a node n only depends on its children and grandchildren. So basically, a node n depends on the nodes in its own subtree that are below it. That kind of suggests that for a bottom-up solution, you should use like basically kind of like a post-order like traversal. So essentially, if you have a tree, um, you know, you have a tree and its shape is uh, like this. You know, just very simple. You have a tree whose shape is like this. It basically suggests that the way to go about it is, you know, you can start here and then you go down here. You are not filling in any values yet. And now, now when you reach a leaf, you fill in a value. So you solve this one. You basically would solve it in this order, like solve this one first, then solve this one. Uh, then you would go up here, and now you can solve this one because all of its dependencies have been satisfied. Then you go up here, and you still can't solve it, right? This is like post-order traversal. Uh, and you go down here for, like you would basically be solving them in this order, following like a, you would still use recursion here probably just to do the tree traversal, like just because it's very inconvenient to do tree traversals iteratively. So you know, it's kind of, it's kind of weird because usually you think of bottom up as basically completely avoiding recursion. But here, like, if you will still use recursion to do a bottom up just for the tree traversal, but you will not do like a recursion on the actual dynamic programming relationship. Like that's the difference. And like what I mean by you won't do recursion on the dynamic programming relationship is you won't write it as this equation. You will instead kind of like say, 
uh, well, it'll, it'll be a similar equation, but you won't invoke like these recursive calls here. It'll be just like, just like when you convert a top-down solution to bottom-up, you optimize away the recursive calls. Like here, you, like in, in the bottom-up solution, you will basically write that when it's time to evaluate a node, you will take its value, and then you will traverse down to its children picking up their value, and traverse down to their grandchildren picking up their values. Uh, putting these into a sum and then just evaluating this, but you won't recursively call another function here. But while, while you're still using recursion to traverse the tree, I, I hope that's not confusing. Uh, like that, maybe that sounds a little bit confusing, but like the point is, is like there's two separate things here, right? Right. One is like you have to like somehow traverse the tree to, you know, you know, you need this kind of like post-order type traversal. You need to evaluate nodes after all their children have been evaluated. And post-order doesn't just apply to binary trees, right? You can do a post-order traversal on, you know, on an n-every tree. It just means evaluate your children before you evaluate yourself. Uh, so you will still need some kind of traversal to, to visit the tree in that order. You will need to like visit your children before you visit yourself, right? Uh, before you compute the value for yourself. So you'll still kind of basically need to evaluate in this sort of order. And it's very inconvenient. Like you can do it if you want, but it's very inconvenient to uh, you know, just try to cover a tree, try to traverse a tree iteratively. So you will do that part recursively, but for the equation, you will you will optimize away the recursion for like the actual evaluation. That's very cool. You don't need a parent pointer. Uh, yeah, yeah, you don't. Uh, okay. You can. Yeah. Would you be able to put this tree in a way where you kind of put all the leaves first, then all the next layer, then all the next layer? Is that a practical way to do it? So then you don't have to do this recursive call. Uh, perhaps, but but if you wanted to do that, uh, so the question was like, why not put the leaves in an array or something in some like order? Uh, the problem is like you would end up having to have like offsets into the array to uh, kind of figure out like. You, you know, like a node will need to know where its left child and where its right child is. So you will end up basically encoding a binary tree in an array if you do that. Like, yeah, if you try that, you will end up encoding a binary tree into an array, in an array. Because you will have to have like pointer offsets into the array indicating where your children are, and that's kind of the same thing as just serializing a binary tree. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next problem. Uh, okay, so the next problem, I don't think it's like, uh, that hard either. Like, hopefully you didn't think this problem was difficult. Like, it's, you know, I, I go over this kind of problem because it does create kind of like mental roadblocks for people. Maybe if you've like never seen this type of dynamic programming problem before. But there's nothing like, I hope you recognize like no new concepts there. It's like the same concept as before. Like, you do dynamic programming the same way you've always done it. It's just like, okay, instead of it being an array index that's being cached, it can be the node itself. Uh, it can be like a pointer to the node or some identifier of the node. And then, you know, just in accordance with the logic of the problem, you construct the recurrence. Uh, but, you know, you, uh, you, to get good at dynamic programming, you have to, like, practice some problems. And, you know, you have to practice problems of every type. And, you know, you might want to try a few tree problems that involve dynamic programming. Okay, so this next uh, problem is basically kind of like, it, it's kind of a math problem, it's a, but it's a, pretty, it's a pretty simple one initially. Uh, so, uh, th this is what's called Catalan numbers, uh, or Catalan, I'm, I'm not sure if the, like the, even the correct way to pronounce it, I think it's Catalan. Uh, so the Catalan numbers are basically just like this like sequence of numbers, uh, you know, that like is named after some mathematician who studied it. But the point is, is like the nth Catalan number is basically the number of, dis it's the number of ways, to, it's the number of differently shaped binary trees of size n. Uh, so here's kind of how we can kind of state the problem. So suppose I give you like a sequence. So, you know, I, I give you a sequence of numbers. And I ask you basically how many binary search trees you can form on this sequence. Like how many distinct binary search trees. So for example, here is a binary search tree. This is one possible binary search tree on this sequence. So binary search tree uh, obeys the ordering rule. 
right? Like everything, you know, because four is at the root, everything to the right of the root uh, is greater than four. Everything less than the root is, you know, to the left of the root. And the same rule applies kind of for each subtree recursively. So this is, you know, standard binary search trees, right? So the question is, like, how many distinctly shaped binary search trees can you generate for this sequence? Uh, so what would be a distinct shape? Well, like, four doesn't have to be at the root, right? Like, you can imagine another tree where three is at the root, and then one has to be here, uh, necessarily. But then, you know, this could be shaped however you want. Like, maybe it's shaped like, like so. Right? This would be, like, another shape. And this is also valid. This tree is kind of unbalanced, but, you know, we're not asking for balanced trees. So, like, this would be one, this would be two. How many total, total trees can you get? Okay, so, um, well, we, we can try to count them. Um, and here's how we we're going to count them. And the reason I show this problem is because this problem is actually like a really simple instance of kind of a general pattern that appears in more complicated problems. Uh, and then I'll show you a more complicated problem that has the same pattern. Uh, so, and this is like a very, very classic pattern in dynamic programming. It appears in tree problems and it appears in some other types of problems too. Like very, very good pattern to know. Okay, so, so the idea here is uh, we, like, we want to know how many different trees, right? But one thing we'll note first is that once we decide the shape of the tree, we have no choice over the position of the elements. Like, okay, for this problem, assume like all the elements are distinct. Uh, so once we decide on some shape, like let's say I just draw any shape, like I don't fill in the values, right? I just decide on some shape. Here's a shape. Now I have no choice as to how to fill in the values, right? There's only one correct way to fill in the values so that this is a binary search tree. Like, whatever number is here, it has to be this number, right? Because, because two numbers are less than it. So I must fill this in with four. I cannot fill any other number in here. And whatever number is here, there's going to be a number greater than it. So this must be one, and this must be three. And, and this, whatever is here must be in the middle, so it must be seven. And like this was the only choice. So, so you see, like once you pick a shape, there is like no other choice. There's only one unique way to fill in the numbers. Uh, so then the question is really, how many different shapes are there? Well, um, OK. So here's how, one way we can count them. So let's say we pick some number for the root. Now, of course, we can pick any number for the root. But let's say we pick one. Like, let's say we pick one particular number. We pick this one, right? So here we go four, right? Four is at the root. So now this is gonna have some left subtree on the elements one and three. And this is gonna have some right subtree on the elements six, seven, 10, right? And basically each of these cases are solvable independently. Each of these is a subarray. This is the common pattern that I was talking about that you kind of split things into subarrays and do dynamic programming on subarrays. Uh, so 4 splits the range into this subarray of 1 and 3, and this subarray of 6, 7, 10. And now each of these cases can be solved independently. We can ask, how many different shapes can you generate for just the numbers 1 and 3? And the answer here is obviously 2, right? You can generate this shape, or you can generate this shape, right? These are the two shapes you can generate for this. And how many shapes can you generate here? Well, for three, it's a bit more, right? Because you can go six, seven, ten. You can go six, ten, seven. You can go uh, seven, and then you get six and ten here. Uh, you can go, and then there's like mirrors of these two, right? Because you can get like, uh, let's see, ten. Yeah, you can get ten, and then there's like six and seven, and you can get 10, and there's seven and six. So uh, there's basically five choices here. There's five ways to arrange these three elements. There's five different binary, binary tree shapes for three elements. Uh, and for, th for, one, for two elements, there's only two shapes. So now, based on this, can we say how many total shapes there are that have four as the root? 
Well, it has to be the product of these two, right? Why the product? Because these are combinations. Like, you, can, you basically select one of these five, right? And then you select one of these two independently. Uh, so basically, like, first select this one, and then select each of these and create the tree that way. Then select this one, and again, each of these creates a tree. So it's basically this number multiplied by this number. And furthermore, I note that like the values here really don't matter. Like it, the, the fact that it's one and three, like it could be 10 and 20 for all I care. It doesn't change anything, right? So basically this is completely a function of just how many uh, numbers there are, right? So let, let us denote, let, let c of x denote the number of ways, to, or c of n, denote the number of ways, this will stand for like catalan or count or whatever you want to call it, c of n is basically the number of binary tree, tree shapes for n elements. So basically then, here we have, yeah, here we have some subtree of like 1 and 3, and the answer to it is c of 2. Whatever, like this, this is the number of ways to make a binary tree with two elements. And this is c of 3. And we would multiply them together, and that's the number of ways to make a, to make a tree with 4 as the root. But now we're not done here, right? Why are we not done? Because 4 doesn't have to be the root. In fact, any element can be the root. So actually, we have to go over all of them, right? But now, what will actually happen, uh, so, so let's, let, let's uh, think about it. Uh, what will actually happen if 1 is the root? Like, if 1 is the root, then the tree looks like this, right? 1, and then there's some subtree here, but there's nothing here, right? There's nothing. This is null. Okay. So, uh, what will the answer in this case be? Well, how many uh, how many trees are in here? Like, how many possible trees are in here? C of five. Yeah, C of five. So this can be one of C of five trees, and uh, this is basically C of zero. Uh, what is the value of C of zero? It's one actually, right? It should be one, not zero. Right? Why not zero? Because like we, we want to count something here, right? Like basically the number of trees with one as the root is exactly equal to c of five, because if you choose one, you have no choices here, so you don't do anything here. And then here, you know, you have c of five choices. So uh, basically, uh, you know, you want to count this as one, so when you multiply these, it's still correct. You might think it's weird that like the number of ways to make zero choices is one, but that actually, like, you know, commonly mathematical definitions are kind of chosen in that way so that they make sense in these types of products. You see that in, like, kind of, like, factorial, uh, like, you know, like, binomial coefficient, too. Like, the number of ways to do zero things is usually one. Yeah? For this, for the if element, if there are three elements, we basically did laid them all out. Uh -huh. Is that just, um, like, is there any insight that it would give five? Because commonly we would no. Do, I'm gonna put six as the root and check the combinations. Seven as the no, root. no. There's no. There like like you don't have to know what these are. I just showed them just you know just to give you something like concrete to associate with, uh, with you know this kind of more abstract stuff. But when we really kind of consider it, like we're only thinking about like these c coefficients. Like we don't have to think of the values being five or whatever else. Right, like, like I, I don't care what c of three is. Like, I'm just saying, like, this is c of two times c of three. I just showed that it was five, just to, you know, j just out of interest. Like, so you get like a better feel for intuitively what these numbers are. Oh, so in this case, then what would be the base cases that we know for sure? Ah, uh, c of zero. C of zero equals one. Oh. Yeah. Well, but, uh, like the reason I haven't done the base case yet was we haven't done the general case yet, right? Like, you know, we, we're building up to the general case, and we're pretty much there at this point. Uh, okay, so basically, well, first, you know, before we write it for like c of n, okay, let's go ahead and write it for like c of six. Uh, so for c of six, what is like what is the answer here? Uh, so basically, you have to try every number as the root, right? So you try one as the root, and that gives you c of zero times c of five. This scenario, right? Then you have to try three as the root, which will give you c of one, right? Because you will, with three as the root. Uh, three as the root, you will basically have one have a binary tree on one element here, and you will have the, these 
four here. You will have a tree of four elements here. Uh, so you will have like C of four, right? And then we will have this case that we studied earlier with the four as the root, C of two times C of three. And at, you, you can see the pattern here, I'm sure. Right, because, because you're just kind of scrolling through these elements and choosing each one as the root. So now here there's three on the left and two on the right. Here's there's, like when you choose seven, there's four on the left and one on the right, and so on. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so this is what you get. And uh, so, so, so in general, if you want to write a general formula, well, okay, here, here we go again with the sigmas. I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll use the sum, it's fine. Uh, so for i from 0 to n minus 1, inclusive on both sides, we will need a c of i multiplied by a c of n minus i minus 1. So, so see how, like, for c of 6, that means that you know, first I do 0 here, so this is c of 0 times c of 6 minus 0 minus 1, c of 5. Then, then, you know, this goes up, c of 1, c of 4, c of 2, c of 3. Now, of course, you can probably tell that this section, like, you could actually optimize this a little bit more by evaluating only half of these and then doubling the total, right? Because you can see that there's a symmetry. This will go to c of 4, c of 1. And multiplication is commutative, so that's fine. Uh, but you know, you can evaluate only half of these, but that doesn't really affect the asymptotic complexity. Because, because they're symmetric, right? Okay. Now, of course, if there's like C of 7, one of the cases will be like C of 3, C of 3. So you have to be careful, like there's one case that's not doubled, the one that's in the middle, right? Like, like C of 7 will generate only one case of C3 times C3. Ah, uh, so, you know, just, just writing it like this, keeping it simple. Uh, okay, now again, uh, this would actually cause like an exponential blow up if you were to evaluate it with naive recursion. Why? Because, well, you know, like, like keep in mind that C of n actually calls every value of C below it. Like if you look at like what C of n calls, right? C of n, over the course of its summation, it calls C of, n, C of 0, C of 1, C of 2. It'll call like all of them, right? And then, of course, each of these cases will call a bunch of other cases. And so this is like a really sprawling recursion tree. This is like a vastly expanding recursion tree. Because like, this will call everything in its summation. So you like more than ever, we need dynamic programming to do this. Uh, OK, but the bottom-up solution is easy here, right? Like, what is the bottom-up solution? We probably want to solve this bottom-up because it's much easier bottom. Well, I mean, it, it's easy either way. But uh, the bottom up is very easy to see here because higher values depend only on smaller values of c. So a, of course, just you know, start at c of zero. Uh, so the base case is c of zero. You know, I'll leave it as an exercise to very verify that this is enough. Like you don't need like a different base case for c of one, for example. Why why not? Because like okay, c of one like will just degenerate into a sum of one item of c of zero times c of zero. C of zero times c of zero is one. So C of one is one, which is correct. There's only one way to structure a binary tree with one element. Uh, so, you know, and how about C of two? Let's just check that this works. C of two will be C of zero times C of one plus C of one times C of zero. So two, there's two ways to structure. Okay, and, and you know, just one more because we saw the example earlier of C of three that was like the first non-trivial example where the answer is maybe you thought it was gonna be six, but it was actually just five. And it was just five because there's that one case in the middle, right? There's, uh, there's like this shape of tree, and there's only one of such tree. There's not like two different trees that are shaped like this, which is why the answer was not six, it was five. Uh, so let's just check that C of three works. Well, well, look at what happens with C of three. We get C of zero times C of two. We get C of one times C of one. And we get C of two times C of zero. So see how there's two of these, but there's only one of these. So th this value, this is one times two, this is one times two, but this is one times one, so you get five. <clears throat> okay, so this formula is clearly working. Uh, yeah, and this is a sufficient base case for it. 
Uh, yeah, and, 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 and this is all. You can just solve it bottom up by starting with zero. So I just wanted to show kind of this pattern. And now I want to go into like a more uh, complicated problem that features this pattern. <clears throat> so any questions on this before I go on? Uh, yep? This one? Yeah. Well, um, you know, like, if your question is about, like, why, why minus one, well, it's just kind of like, you know, it's just like what's necessary to avoid an off by one error. You just, you know, I, I mean, I, I know that, like, for, uh, for example, for, <clears throat> like, like, just think, like, what do you want the first term to be, right? So, for example, for c of six, right, I wanted the first term to be c of zero times c of five, right? Do you remember that? Or like, do we need like additional explanation why like this is C of 5? Yeah, yeah, so this is like, I want this to be C of 5, right? So like this clearly needs to start at 0. But then what is this term? Like, it's like, it's intuitively kind of like n minus i because that term gets smaller, right? But like you need a minus 1 to just make it correct, right? Like because it's, it's going to be 6 minus 0 minus, uh, like, the, like if you didn't have the minus 1, this would be C of 6, right? Which can't be right because then it's circular then you're defining C of 6 in terms of itself. But, but you, we, we want it to be like 1 less, right? Because basically, intuitively, if we choose 1 as the root, there are, you know, the binary tree on the left is the, binary, is the unique binary tree of zero elements, which is the empty binary tree. And the binary tree on the right is on the remaining n minus 1 elements. It's not on the n elements, it's on the n minus 1. Yeah? Well, how would this change if we had uh, like a repeating element? If we had what? If we had, if we allowed like repeating elements. <clears throat> oh, if you have repeating elements, well, um, <clears throat> I guess in the case of repeating elements, there would kind of be the question of like, how do you even define binary trees on repeating elements? Like, what are the rules? Like, uh, so most binary trees actually don't allow repeating elements. So you have to just think like, what does it mean? Uh, like, okay, so you could make up a rule. You could say, okay, if you you know, you could make up a rule for where repeated elements are expected to be in the tree, and then the answer probably depends based on that. But you know, most binary trees don't allow repeating elements. So, you know, most binary trees, even if they, even if they're like multi-sets and they handle repeating elements, the way they usually handle it is like, at you know, the, all the keys will be unique internally, but they'll just make an array of all the values that are at that key. <clears throat> So yeah, it can, and, and then it also like you have to ask like what does it mean for a tree to be distinct? Like, is is it only distinct if you know all if it actually like looks different, or is it distinct if uh, well, let's say you permute two like let's say you had two fives in there, and then you permute the two fives. Does it look you know is that still the same tree or not? Yeah. So so like once you give all these definitions, maybe you, maybe you can come up with an answer. Okay, well, I, I want to go on to like a more interesting problem of this nature, and this is a very nice problem. This is on, uh, this is actually, I, 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 no, I personally feel like, out of like the problems on leaf code, like this is like, got to be like one of the like hardest problems on leaf code. Like there's not like a lot of, I mean, leaf code, like it's not meant to be like really, really hard. It's mostly like a collection of like interview questions. Like you might be looking at me like, no, it's crazy, like leaf code is hard. But like, what I mean is, like, leaf code is not designed primarily to, you know, have really, really challenging questions because, like, most of the questions are actually, like, potential interview questions, right? And you're not going to have, like, a tremendously difficult algorithmic problem to solve in, like, you know, even a one-hour interview, if, if your interview is even one hour. Uh, and, well, today, hopefully, we won't take 45 minutes on this problem. Well, A, because I'm not going to write the code, I'll leave that as an exercise, but this is a great problem for you to practice on because it's actually it's actually difficult if you can if you can solve if you can write the code for this problem, you've really understood it, and you really have kind of like mastered this like subarray splitting pattern. Uh, so you know definitely and definitely a very important pattern to master for dynamic programming. So definitely I will post a link later of where to find this problem on lead code, and that's kind of like you know. You know, I've been kind of informally saying there's like a homework for like these sessions. But what I really mean is like, you know, you have to practice if you want to get good at this stuff. And these are the things I would most recommend practicing. So this is like, will be like the homework for today. Um, so here's the problem. Just to wrap up on the previous one, it yep. will be linear, right? Time complexity will be linear. 
Oh, sorry, yeah, I guess I should have mentioned the time complexity. Yeah, the time complexity will be linear. So I will also mention that for the previous problem, there actually is kind of like a closed form formula for it as well. Uh, it's, not, it's not a simple formula. It has, like, it has like binomial coefficients in it and stuff. But basically the guy who studied it, like Catalan, he came up with this like closed form formula for it. Well, closed form can mean anything, but like in this case, I mean like there's some formula that uh, is expressed in terms of like powers, factorials, and binomial coefficients, which is once again factorials. So basically you can, in, in, in terms of like multiplication, division, factorial, and power operations, you can express the answer to that as well. But it's not easy to derive that formula. I mean, it's not super hard, but it's not, it's not easy. Like, the proof of that formula is not like super intuitive or anything. Uh, so you could also solve the problem that way if you know that formula. But if you don't, like, like see, this is how you can come up with a, a solution from first principles, like just dynamic programming. OK. Uh, yeah, and then maybe it would be better than linear if you use the closed form formula, if you do it right. But uh, with the dynamic programming, yeah, it's linear, which is like way better than the exponential time you would have had. Uh, you, you would have got, got an exponential time with either naive recursion, or if you actually explicitly tried to enumerate all the trees, that would also be an exponential time algorithm. You can prove that the Catalan numbers grow exponentially. That's not hard to prove. Or you, it's easy to show that they grow at least exponentially. So did you say if you use the formula, then it's uh, not linear? It's... Yeah, I don't want to go into that right now, but like if you have a formula, like you know, the formula will contain like powers and factorials. Well, actually, no, it's probably still linear because you need like the time to evaluate the factorials. But uh, maybe you can find, like, like once you have a closed form formula, maybe you can find like a better than linear way. Uh, because, for example, you can take the nth power of a number in better than linear time. Uh, but, you know, I'd have to think like, can it even be better? Uh, and that's the, really not the point. I want to go on to the next problem. Uh, OK. So the next problem is kind of like this uh, fun uh, balloon popping problem, because who doesn't like to pop balloons? Um, and, uh, so, and, and really, the setup of the problem is kind of tricky. Like, you know, I have to admit, like, even when I solved this problem, like, it, it did confuse me for a good like, five or 10 minutes before you know, I came up with like, the dynamic programming uh, formula for it. Because it's kind of stated in a confusing way where you might first like, not believe that dynamic programming can really be used to solve this. But, but, but then you realize how it works, and then you can come up with the solution. Uh, so basically, the idea is there's a bunch of balloons in a line. Now I'm a really bad artist, so my balloons are just going to look like this. They're like little place pins on Google Maps or something. Yeah, so, so basically, you have a bunch of balloons in a line. And each balloon has a number written on it. All the numbers are positive, let's say. OK, so here's what happens. You can pop the balloons in any order you want. You're allowed to pop the balloons in your choice of order. The, basically, the goal of the problem is to pick, is to establish what is the order you would like to pop the balloons in, such that a certain objective that I'm about to mention is optimized. So whenever you pop a balloon, you earn points. And the points you earn is if you pop a balloon, you, you basically earn the product of the three balloons around it. So for example, you know, if I pop this balloon, I will earn two times one times six points. And I, I will receive 12 points for popping this balloon. After I pop this balloon, this will be eliminated. Like I will get 12 in my bank. And this will be eliminated, and these two balloons are now considered adjacent. Two and six will now be next to each other. Like the balloons ship together after one is popped. And now I can pop one again. Let's, let's say I choose to pop this one. By the way, this is probably almost certainly not the optimal popping sequence. Uh, so the goal will be to maximize the number of points you get. Basically, choose the popping sequence that maximizes the number of points. Uh, but let's say you pop six now. This would earn 2 times 6 times 3 points, because these are all adjacent. And the end would eliminate 6. And you would get 2 times 3 times 6, which is 36. So you would go ahead and add 36 to your bank, in addition to your previous 12 points. Now, let's say you pick 2. 
4 times 2 times 3 gives you, uh, what, uh, 24 points. Uh, now let's let and now uh, what is the rule if you pick up if you pop a balloon up on the edge? Well, basically, if you pop a balloon on the edge, it's as if over here you had a one. Basically, basically, it just means like you don't get any like you don't get any credit, but you don't get zero either. The problem doesn't change much if you get zero. Like if you got zero, then you would uh, just be like a special case. But like. <clears throat> Basically, it's as if you just get the product of these two. So here, uh, uh, obviously for two balloons, it's clear which popping order is better, right? If you have two balloons of unequal value, like just like intuition check here. If you have um, two balloons of unequal value, do you pop the smaller balloon first or the larger balloon first? The smaller. The smaller. Yeah. Uh, correct. Smaller is correct. Why? So, like, let's say you have a balloon with uh, value, well, let's say in this case, four and three, right? Whichever of these balloons I pop first, that particular pop earns the same amount. It earns the product of the two, right? But then I still get credit for popping the last one at the end. So, basically, if I pop, four, if I pop three first, I will get 12 points for that. And then I get to pop the four balloon, so the four balloon is considered as having, like, one on each end. You know, because there's only one left, so I only get credit for one. Uh, so, so basically, in this case, um, it is better to uh, leave the larger one, because I will get the same amount of credit for popping either of these, but then if I'm left with a larger one, I get slightly more points. Yep. So three and four aren't adjacent? No, they are. They are. Because all the balloons in between have been popped, these are adjacent. So then if you pick three, why wouldn't four be considered the one on the left to be It is, it oh, is. Like, no, it is. Like, basically the one on the right is considered to be one because there's nothing there. And basically it's the, one is just the identity for multiplication. So, so basically what's happening here is like, if you pick three, you will get 12 points for popping. Uh, three. But then when you pop four, you will still earn four points for popping four. But let's say you popped four first, you would again earn 12 points for popping four, but now you have to pop a three, which only gives you three points, so you would end up with one point less. Make sense? Yeah. So it's always better to pop the smaller balloon first if you just have two. So if you yep. sorted the values of all the balloons at the beginning and you pop them from smallest to biggest, is that, would that always give you the best answer? So that would be like a greedy algorithm idea, and um, no. I mean, or, or at least you would have to prove that that actually works, and it probably does not. Uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of like where, where it would be like obvious that like that definitely doesn't work. Um, um, well, okay, we can we can think about it later. Like, like it's certainly not clear that that works. Like, it, it is, like, in some sense intuitive that you want to pop smaller balloons first, but at the same time, like, it may not, like, always be the case that this is so. I mean, certainly in the case of two balloons, that is always correct. But we'd have to reason about why it's correct in general. I very much doubt that that's correct in general. And this is like another reason why dynamic programming can be useful sometimes. Like, like let's say that were even true. Like, I, I don't think that's true. I don't think it, it would be optimal to pop the balloons in sorted order. I, I mean, for one, there could probably be cases where there's ties and it's not clear what you should pop then. Uh, and, and, and there's probably still cases where that matters. Uh, but let, let's even say that such a thing were true and there were like a simple algorithm that just, for example, pops them in order of value. And that was like somehow correct. Like, you only know that, like, that's correct if you actually, like, reason about it and have, like, a proof that that's correct, right? With dynamic programming, you can often construct these solutions that, you know, obviously if you miss something like so, some simple strategy, like popping them in ascending order turns out to be correct. Uh, you know, if you miss some simple strategy, you might get, like, a worse time complexity with dynamic programming. But at least you'll construct a solution that, like, you know is correct because it's kind of correct from the you know, from just writing the function you're trying to optimize and solving it recursively. Uh, so sometimes it can be good if you can like 
if you're like unable to prove whether a certain greedy strategy is correct or not. And I'm pretty sure I've seen like counterexamples of this where like uh, I, I don't care to kind of try to find a counterexample right now, but you know I'm pretty sure I've seen counterexamples of this where like that is not correct to pop it in ascending order. Uh, okay, so how like, like let's think about this. How can we approach this? Uh, so basically, we have like the balloons are kind of given as like an array. So we have like some values in an array, and we have to come up with like an optimal popping sequence. Well, okay. So the key insight here. Uh, remember, I said this was going to be kind of like the same pattern as before, right? And the pattern is basically like splitting in terms of subarrays. So how can you split in terms of subarrays here? Well, the key thing here is to focus on the one balloon whose value you actually know. Like what I mean is you don't know what value you will earn for most of these balloons. And the reason is is because it depends what balloons will be adjacent to them at the time that you pop them. Uh, like in other words, like you remember like most dynamic programming problems and arrays are kind of like say like kind of like the knapsack problem where we start at each element and we kind of go and visit the elements one at a time and we say, uh, you know, do you want to pop this one? Do you want to pop this one? Do you want to like you know, that's the usual kind of thinking with dynamic programming, where you like visit all the elements in the array and you just, you know, iterate through them and you're kind of thinking like, okay, do I want to take this element or leave this element sort of thing. That's kind of like how knapsack works, for example. Uh, this definitely does not fall into that pattern because you, you don't get to skip any elements, you have to pop all of them. Uh, but the order really matters, it's all about order. So when ordering really matters, it kind of like throws a wrench into your dynamic programming class. But then, you know, you can kind of think of it as like, um, well, what is the one balloon whose value I can certify? Uh, you know, I can't really say, like, when I pop this six, it, it, I mean, it's, it may be kind of hard for me to say, like, what value it's going to earn, because it kind of depends what other balloons I pop beforehand. Like, if I've already eliminated this three and one, then when I pop the six, I might earn four times six times five. Or not, if I've already eliminated the four, then maybe I'll just earn one times six times five. But um, there is one balloon whose value I can certify, and that is the last one. I don't know which one will be the last one, but whatever balloon is last, I can say how many points it's gonna earn. How many points is the last balloon gonna earn? It's own value. It's own value, yes. So now, um, basically I will do this. I will kind of guess a balloon, to be the last balloon. And I will try all possible last balloons, like kind of similar to how, you know, in the previous problem, we guessed a root and we tried all possible roots. And then for each possible root, we said here are the values that have to be on the left, here are the values that have to be on the right. Um, here, I will guess a last balloon, I will score, you know, score some points for it, and then I will say, okay, now you have a problem to solve on the left and you have a problem to solve on the right. Uh, so, let's say you pick this balloon as the last balloon. Now, of course, I don't know that that is the last balloon. I will have to try every, I will have to guess every possible last balloon. And, you know, in the previous problem, because we were interested in the total number of combinations, we took like a sum. Here we will take a max, because we're interested in the best variation. So we will take a max. So it will be max over all the possible last balloons of, okay, let's say I take this three. So basically, with this three, how many points will it earn? It will earn three points. And then, at, uh, th this will be the last balloon popped. So what does that really mean? Uh, that means that now, I, at some point, I have to pop these balloons. And this popping happens strictly before I pop this balloon. And I have to pop all of these balloons. And all of that popping, too, happens before I pop this balloon. So now, here's what that really means. That means that the, the pops on this side and the pops on this side can be interleaved in any order. Like, it doesn't matter if I go pop some on this side and then I pop some on this side. These kind of can't interact because this three that we know to be popped later is separating. So the th this three is constant. And there's also like a constant one over here. And there's a constant one over here. So basically, whatever popping happens over here, it happens with constants on either side. Like, we know what numbers will be at the edges as these pops are happening. 
And as these pops are happening, we know what numbers will be at the edges too. Like, nothing that happens here can interfere with this, because this 3 is anchoring it. It's kind of like isolating the effect of this from this. So essentially, I can see my popping strategy as being a tree. How, why so? Because, like, like, let the most recent action be at the top. Then here are some actions that pop 4 and 6. So for example, if I, you know, if I had this subtree here, that would mean that I pop 4 first and then I pop 6. More recent is at the top. So, so like if I had like this, it would mean uh, uh, here, here like there's no like binary search tree ordering, like to be clear. Like here, you know, I, I, it doesn't matter how I draw it, this is just a child. That's all that matters. Uh, here, like what I'm saying is like the fact that the six is on top, like think of it as kind of like heap ordering. On top just means one thing, but it doesn't matter which child is left or right. Uh, so the, this three on top basically means that this three happens later. But now I kind of draw it like this. You know, like you don't have to think of this as being related to trees at all. But like a tree representation like this, it's useful to see what's going on. It's kind of like an arithmetic tree. Like think of like, um, think of like something like this, right? This is called an expression tree. It's really the same concept, right? So sometimes like we can represent arithmetic like so. Like hopefully that makes sense. And why, why would we represent arithmetic as a tree? Because it's kind of showcasing that these two cases are really independent. Does it like, make, make sense? Yeah. yeah, like we're basically saying like the order of evaluation of this is like it really doesn't matter. Uh, by showing it as a tree, we're kind of showing that these things are independent. And I can do a post order on that to get the... Yeah, value. and you can do a post order on this to get the answer. Exactly. Uh, so this is called an expression tree, and essentially we have here what we have is an expression tree for like we, we basically want what we really want is over all possible expression trees for balloon popping, what is the best one? What is the one with the highest value of the objective function? So uh, like you know here we're basically asking what is the highest payoff expression tree for four and six, and what is the highest payoff for one, five, and seven? Uh, like, and here, for example, for 4 and 6, the two options are this, right? You can basically have this, or you can have this. So either you pop 4 first, or uh, rather, 6 first, and then 4 after, or you pop 4 first, and then 6 after. But either way, you pop 3 only after that, and this other thing has completed. That's what it means to pop 3 last. So if you chose to pop 3 last, then you get to pop this, and you get to pop this, and while you're popping this, the number on the right here will always be 3. Now you have to be careful because like, you, you can't treat this as just like a completely brand new problem instance. Like you can't just say solve 4 and 6 recursively, solve 1, 5, and 7 recursively, and treat them as if they were like the main problem instance. There's, because there's a subtle difference, right? Because while you're solving this, there will be, instead of being a 1 on the right, like, if, if this were the full problem instance, if the full, if the full problem were just 4 and 6, right? Let's say the full problem is just 4 and 6. Then it's as if there's a 1 on the left and a 1 on the right. Make sense? But um, here, while we're solving this, there's going to be a 3 on the left and a 3 and a 1, or a 1 on the left and a 3 on the right. So we will have to take that into account, but it, like it seems doable, and in fact, like it's always easy to know what number is here at the bound because it is whatever. Uh, it, like, like it's very easy to say what number it is because it's like if this is the subarray from index i to index j, then this is j plus one, and this is i minus one. Uh, you know, with the, with the you know caveat that if i minus one is negative one, then treat it as one. If it's out of bounds, then treat it as one. Okay, so let's try to write the general equation here. So first of all, um, like I want to write some recursive function f. What should my function parameters be? Like what function parameters do I need to accept? Ij, I, right? Like basically, I want I, uh, basically I want f of ij 
to denote the optimal solution for a particular subarray. And let's, we'll use the convention that i and j is ex inclusive on both ends. So f of ij is like from starting an index i and going all the way up to and including index j, what is the best solution for that subarray? Uh, do we need to pass like these values on the left and the right while we're solving this? Like that does seem like relevant information, but we'll note that if you're solving f of i j, the number on the number that is to the right of you that is fixed is like always always j plus one, right? It's always the, the value at j plus one, and and to the left of you, like let's say you're just in some array, like here's your array, and here you're solving this interval from i to j, right? While you're popping these, the numbers that are fixed around you are basically this one and this one, and this one is at i minus one, and this one is at j plus one. So we kind of don't need to pass additional values here to indicate what are the numbers around you while you pop, uh, because you know you know what they are. They're they're like you know value at i minus one and value at j plus one. Okay, so let's try to construct the recurrence now. Uh, okay, f of i j. So first of all, like if I have some subarray, right? Like, like, let this be my subarray. So first, i will equal 0, and j will equal n minus 1, or whatever. Like, the overall solution to the problem, by the way, like, the overall solution that I want to get is this, right? Like, this will be my overall solution. OK, so um, f of ij, let's write this formula. How much do you get for popping the last one? Yeah, because because remember, you will pop everything. You, well, first you will pick you will pick a last balloon to pop. You will have to try every possible last balloon. But for now, let's write the equation for just one pick of last balloon. Call this index k. Yeah, uh, it's it's actually not 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 quite right. It's not a of k. Like a is the array. Uh, let's not call it a of k because. Uh, you know, that, that assumes that there's a 1 on both ends. That is true in the initial version, but later that may not be true, right? Uh, l later there may be like a different value on each side. So uh, it is actually uh, a of k multiplied by the values on the two sides, right? Basically, the interpretation of this function is what is the maximum value you can get while popping this subarray uh, and having the two balloons around the subarray held constant? What is the maximum value that you would get? OK, so uh, this is a of k, and this is a of a minus 1, and this is a of j plus 1. Um, and we will kind of, um, you know, like this notation is a little bit hacky. Like what I'm saying is like, because this could be out of bounds and this could be out of bounds. Like the, we'll really like replace this array axis with a function that basically like usually it returns the same as this, but like if it's out of bounds, it returns one. But I'm just gonna write it in this array form. I think it's like easier. But basically just think of like, if the axis is out of bounds, we'll give it a value of one. So either you know you can have a helper function or you can just do like the check in line. Like you could basically say, you know, you know, if i you know is negative one, then substitute in one, otherwise access the array. Okay, so this is basically the value of you know the value of popping the last balloon. Okay. Good. Um, what is uh, the uh, w what other value do you earn? Well, you earn whatever's on the left, right? You basically k kind of splits the array into two parts that have to be optimized and solved independently. So, what do you earn on the left? You earn some like, like now here comes the recursion, right? You have to solve the problem for the indices on the left. So, if you pick the index k. That means now you have a problem remaining on i, k minus, uh, k minus uh, 1, yes. Um, and so you're going to solve that, and you're going to optimize for its value. And then additionally, you will also get the, capture the value of all the stuff you did on the right, right? 
which is uh, what? Uh, k plus 1, 2, j. Okay, so that's it. That's basically it for the general case. Um, what uh, else do we need? We need like a base case, right? So what is the, you know, what is the base case? Well, um, basically we can say if the array is empty, it yields zero. That would be like a suitable base case. Because like, you know, so, so like when, when do we really boil down to a base case? Like, well, okay, so let's say we only have one element, right? So one element, like this will be scored correctly. It will, like when you pop this, you will get whatever's on either side of it multiplied by this element. Uh, that's this equation. Uh, and then here you will get, uh, you know, these two calls. And what will they be? Well, um, if this was, like, let's say i equals j equals k, basically, in this scenario, right? Like in this scenario, there's only one element, i equals j. Uh, because the end and the start element are the same, and then that's the only choice of k, so i equals j equals k. So then here you will get basically i, i minus 1, and here you'll get i plus 1 to i. So basically your, your range is like, you know, not correct. Your range is like inverted. Uh, and basically when that happens, you will say like this is just, th this just signals the empty array, and that is worth 0. So basically you will just cancel like, it's as if you didn't make this call when the array is empty. So, like, in, you can just, for convenience, you can just say, like, when the array is empty. So, like, in other words, when the, when the start index is greater than the end index, like, if in this call, the base case is basically i is uh, greater than j. Like, basically, if i greater than j uh, returns 0, else, it's else this is the formula. So, quick question. Uh -huh. Would we put a summation from uh, like k? k will take all values from... Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Like, uh, right, I forgot to complete one part of this, which is that, like here I'm assuming a fixed choice of k, but we don't know like what the choice of k is, so it's not a summation. It's not a summation, it's a max. Yeah. Because you have to take the best one. So basically, this is max over all k. But what 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 k do we want? Uh, so k has to be in the subrange i to j, right? Uh, and k can include i and j themselves. So basically, we will write it like this. Or sorry, uh, k uh, like like so. Yeah of this. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, like basically of all of this. So, so, the, so like here is basically the final formula. Basically, overall solution, the overall solution we want is f of 0 and minus 1. And then I define, I define f of i j as, this is the base case, base case, right? And this is the like major case, this is like the uh, general case. max over all of the, all possible choices of k of this formula. Okay, so what is the time complexity of this? Before we finish, like one, like we're pretty much done here. Like this is the recurrence. Um, well, so top down, you will just write it like this. Uh, bottom up, um, well, it's trickier to see how to, how to do this bottom up. I would probably suggest you solve this problem top down because you know with these indexes i and j, it's really hard to see how you're gonna solve it bottom up. Uh, I mean, I'll give you a hint. If you really were you know hell bent on solving it bottom up, I mean, obviously you have to find like a valid ordering of dependencies. So you might note that larger arrays, like larger span of i and j, can only call smaller spans. So to make sure your recursion is non, you know, to make sure you can 
stated in a, in a way, you might want to like kind of reparameterize this problem a little bit. So instead of making it i and j, I would recommend you make an f of i and l, where l is a length. So basically, uh, like you, b before j would have just been i plus l. So basically, instead of parameterizing in terms of start and end, you, you know, if you want to solve it uh, bottom up, like why not parameterize it in terms of start and the length of the run? That will be a little easier for you because now you can say that higher values of L depend only on lower values of L and things like that. Like it's hard to say which values of i, j can depend on other values of i, j, but you can kind of see it when you reparameterize it that way. If you, if instead we turn this, you know, we just did some math. Basically, basically let j equal i plus l, and just let's make the substitution everywhere. We'll put an l here, and everywhere where j appears here, we'll just make the substitution uh, based on this equation. You know, so l equals j minus i. Uh, you know, uh, we'll just make like that substitution. Or, or sorry, uh, j, yeah, yeah, we'll just make this substitution. So everywhere where this appears, we'll you know change it. Uh, Everywhere where J appears, we'll change it to I plus L, and we'll you know have an L in here. Uh, and if we do that, we can reparameterize the problem, and then it's clear that larger values of L depend only on smaller values of L. That gives you some ordering of dependencies that you can trust. Uh, but I would just suggest you go ahead and solve this top down. If I were to memoize this, I would require both I, J, of course. and K, right? All three of no, 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 no. No, you like no, no. That's like, like remember the key principle of like dynamic programming is like you parameterize the parameters of the function. Like k is an internal parameter. K is a local variable. You cannot memoize it. You memoize the outer function call. Like the function call is on i j. It has no k parameter. K is an internal variable. So so what will be in your cache? It will be pairs of i j. It will be like possibly every possible pair of ij. However, internally, you will use the variable k and possibly make more than one call you know, for, to evaluate a given ij. So which brings us to the final point before we go on our break, which is uh, you know, what is the time complexity of this? And, and there's so many problems that have like a very similar structure to this. So it's really good to like, like see, when I see this, I like immediately know what the time complexity analysis is, because this is the complexity analysis of most problems that have this pattern of like splitting summaries. Because typically, well, okay, like remember, what is the, uh, what is the formula for uh, the time complexity of a dynamic programming algorithm? Number of states. Number of states. Multiplied by the time per state. Okay, so number of states, how many? No, not n. Not a trick question. Not number of pairs, right? Uh, so n squared. It's like n squared over 2 maybe, but it's like order n squared. Okay, great. So number of states. Yeah, not a trick question, guys. Uh, order n squared. Okay. Um, and then time per state, how many? Uh, well, this is trickier. Like, you can't assume it's order one, right? It's not order one. I'll give you a hint. Like, it's not order one. And there's no advertised analysis which makes it order one. It's definitely not order one. What, what is the, like, time complexity per state? This is a loop. Yeah, it's basically j minus i. But you, you, to put a bound on j minus i, you have to assume it's just n. Okay, so time per state is order n. So, so total is what? n cubed. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a, it's a high time complexity. It's n cubed, but you know, it's still polynomial. A lot of dynamic programming solutions have time complexity like n squared and cubed. Like that, that is definitely not atypical. And in fact, n cubed is the typical time complexity for this pattern, which is splitting separates. Usually it ends up being n cubed, why? Because usually you have to, well, usually you have to have n squared states because every possible subarray can be a candidate state that can appear in the recursion. And then for each one, usually you guess an internal pivot, you guess an element that's in the middle, and you have to try each and every one. And uh, then, you know, so you try n possible things, and then you usually evaluate some, like, this formula itself is constant time, like once you have the values here and here, the formula itself is usually constant time. So then you get, you know, n squared times n, n cubed. And this is 
is not, not surprising. This is like, like in, most problems that have this pattern will, you know, you will see this time complexity. Unless you have like some trick up your sleeve where you can somehow optimize something away, you know, usually it's n cubed. 